What's going on, everybody? Welcome into episode eight of the Deal Spotlight. We are going to be spending all of this time breaking down Devon Energy's acquisition of Grace and Mill, which, as you'll kind of come to find out in this episode, I think personally comes out of left field. We've got a great, great guest on the show. He's been here multiple times, John Farrell, co-founder and CEO over at Well Database. We love Well Database, guys. If you have not checked out Well Database, you can go to their website. It's, in my opinion, probably one of the premier oil and gas data services out there. We use them all the time. Really appreciate everything they do over there. And as you'll see in this episode, we're able to dive into all of the little different nuances using that platform. So highly recommend checking this out. But this is an awesome episode, guys. John and I dive into sort of all things surrounding this deal. You know, first talking about uh, you know, kind of the the fit between Devin and Grayson Mill, which you know, in my opinion, is 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 a little wonky relative to where their acreage positions are. We also spend a little bit of time talking about the midstream assets. We of course talk about the three mile development, which is as we learned in Cord Enter Plus, is kind of the move now, specifically going on in the Bakken and 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 down in the Delaware. So we we kind of compare and contrast all things, and then much like we did in forecasting who we thought Grayson Mill was going to sell to back in a previous episode, we kind of lay up and, and figure out who we think's next, guys. Awesome episode. Again, really appreciate John for coming on and doing this with us, but without further ado, let's go ahead and get to the episode. <music> John Farrell, thanks for joining us on the Deal Spotlight. This is going to be a fun one. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Michael. Appreciate it, man. No, absolutely. Um, I, I always enjoy sitting down with you and getting to dive into the weeds. Um, really excited to cover this one. First off, because there's it kind of goes along with the trend we're seeing in the in the M and A market, which is um, private equity selling out at, at at high oil prices. Obviously, we're sitting here at eighty dollar oil. Not no, no better chance for a private equity company to go ahead and uh, and sell out. But two, there's also a chance to review the three mile laterals, which I know we covered um, in one of our last ones that we did specifically with Cord Enterplus. And I and I bring that up at the top because I want to before we dive in here. Real quick, I want to go back in the time back, the the time machine or the way back machine uh, for tech guys out there. Um, we actually, and you specifically brought this up at the end of our Cord Enter Plus um, merger. We covered this a little bit. I, I want to show a clip from that. But when you look at that level of acquisition, what other consolidations might be available? They're pretty rough. They're, I mean, Grayson uh, one Mill jumps is out. the obvious one. I was um, going to say one jumps out. We were talking about this at Nate. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's definitely rumored that they're out there uh, kind of uh, seeing what they can get. Obviously, it's the NCAT backed um, group. And so uh, they should, their operations, I do know a couple of people over there, they're fantastic on the data side. They're fantastic on the operation side. They, uh, they've got their stuff in order. So that'll be my number one to see fall. You, you saw this coming from, uh, in, in three miles away. Good call. No, it's really interesting. It's, uh, it, it is something that was floated out there at one point in time. And I remember yep. we were sitting at Nate talking about this, uh, what, what who was Grayson Mill going to, um, so it's pretty interesting to watch this kind of all come to fruition. And I think we'll touch on it, but it's interesting to see where this is headed next. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, I like to start these out always with a high level discussion about what the what the deal was. And I know there's a bunch of stuff to dive into, but, you know, to kind of quickly highlight the the deal here, obviously, Devon Energy goes ahead and, and dips their toe into the M&A market, buying Grayson Mill, who's a private equity backed um, uh, oil and gas operator, specifically in the Williston Basin um, and, and the Bakken. They were uh, they actually started out as we were talking earlier, they actually started out as a as a Powder River Basin a specific operator and probably found some opportunistic opportunities to go ahead and dive into uh, the, the Bakken, mainly because they went ahead and swooped up Equinor, which was the combination, as we're about to talk about, of, of Stat Oil, who or used to be called, and Brigham. That was about a $900 million acquisition back in, in, in late 2021. Then they followed that up really quickly by buying Oventives. Um mm -hmm. Uh, Bakken assets for about $825 million um, in early 2022, or excuse me, late 2022. So basically, all in all, Grayson Mill was, it consists of, you know, about 1.7 billion uh, Bakken acquisitions relative, um, as I mentioned, for uh, NCAP as the, as the private equity backer here. Um, the total deal was 
basically five billion, which, as we mentioned, was floated back in on January twenty fifth. If you're a news aficionado like myself, you can go back and find uh, on the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. Um, private equity firm NCAP, and I'm reading here straight from the article, is exploring a sale of Grayson Mill that could value the Bakken shale focus oil and gas brews at around five billion dollars, inclusive of debt, and that's exactly what they got. They got three point two five billion of that in cash, one point seven five bill. Uh, 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 billion in stock that accounts for about a hundred thousand BOE per day, relative give or take. It's uh, mm-hmm. if if you know according to um, the the news release, you're sitting at about a what's the oil mix? About a fifty five percent oil mix, twenty five percent NGL mix, and about twenty percent gas. So pretty good nice. liquids mix relative to what you know the Bakken, which is known for a lot of gas over there. Um, you know, really interesting that one, they floated out that five billion dollar mark, and two, they got it. I, right. I, you know, from a high level, John, what do you think about this? I know you know a lot. You, you know, you you floated this a while ago. So give me your kind of thirty thousand foot view on what you thought of this deal before we kind of dive into some of the finer details. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, not too long after that number was floated, there was a couple analysts that came out that said that that sounded high. They thought three and a half up to four and a half sounded like it made sense to them. Um, And offhand, I I tended to agree with that. I thought that you're looking at those acquisitions that you talked about, about 1.7 billion in, they've drilled, um, you know, a number of wells, I think it's in the 70s. So they've got a decent capital expense. in. you're you're talking about a couple of, you know, two and a half billion in um, that they're in, uh, NCAP is in for now. Um, so, but floating that five million number, that five billion number, was really, really smart by them because I think it did set the stage. Especially being a PE backed firm, they were going to be looking for a good cash uh, aspect of it, and it, by floating that number out, they were able to kind of weed out some of the people who are considered a little bit more uh, conservative in their estimates. Um, but then they also threw the kind of what Grayson Mill has proved out in their drilling, kind of the opportunities in three mile laterals. Um, you know, they they did catch a premium. Uh, and then furthermore, the the uh, the midstream assets that is adds a layer that I honestly was not looking at back when I first looked at this deal, the, the potential in February. And if you look at it without any kind of midstream savings, then I do think three and a half to four and a half max is what you're looking at. But there's something about that midstream cost, which I wish I knew more about. Um, but that the, the, the ability to get your production to market in the Bakken is one of the major challenges. And so by having those midstream assets, you've now kind of changed the game, changed the cost game, changed the, uh, changed everything. And I'm I'm sure the bottom line looks good and probably supports that 5 billion, especially when considering that Devin is relatively known for being conservative in their estimates as well. So, but all in all, I think it was a well-played, um, a well-played plan by, uh, uh, Grayson Mill and sorry, no, Grayson Mill and, and uh, <laughs> I think from from Grayson <laughs> from cap, sorry and Grayson Mill side, <laughs> it's exactly I think what you were hoping for. You float a number, you get the number, yep. you, you you the the sale doesn't hold out too long. You're able to exit at a you know a decently high oil price. You go through and and we'll I'll throw up a few slides here in a second. But I mean, pretty much this entire deal looks to be underwritten at eighty dollar oil. Um, a lot mm-hmm. of the 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 you know the their the twelve percent free cash flow yield that they're kind of saying is their base base analysis for Devin now moving forward was underwritten eighty at eighty dollar oil which we can quabble about that's probably a little bit too high for my blood I probably would have gone with seventy but hey I'm not sitting in the seat um, I'm going to throw up two slides here to begin with here's slide number two if you're uh, following along here at home here's kind of the quote unquote transaction overview from Devin's side immediately a cre- to all of their key financial metrics. We couldn't get a, it wouldn't be an M&A deal if we didn't hear the word accretive a few times. So we got to love that. Um, all their key performance indicators, their claimings going up. Uh, it enhances the scale and scope of their quote unquote operations. Um, they're, they're up to about 375 barrels of oil per day, which is pretty incredible from a scale standpoint and, and relative to the amount of, you know, the, it's only 55,000 ish barrels of oil. If you take their 55% um, oil cut number, um, at face value. So, I mean, you know, they, they were already at 325,000 barrels a day. You forget how big Devin really is relative to this, right. um, completely transforms their Willison asset. You know, it triples their in base in production and it's going to add somewhere between four to 500 individual locations, which we'll dive into in a bit. I love it. They also highlight refract candidates and 
we 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 could have a whole nother you know show on what what I think about refract candidates. But yeah. um, from the standpoint of there is a decent inventory. They're claiming now it's about ten years of a three rig program in terms of inventory. Which hey, if at the at the large scale that Devin's playing, which is you know large public operators, inventory is the name of the game because you're gonna that's really how you're gonna get significant value outside of just right. being valued based upon your PDP. You brought up specifically the midstream stuff, which I think is a critical piece to this, which we'll cover in a bit. Um, it, it really allows you know now Devin and allowed Grayson Mill to really produce really like you said, not only bring your oil to market, but also turn what is generally a you know, we talk about this on the accounting side all the time, turn a cost center into a revenue generator. If you now all of right. a sudden have all of this infrastructure that not only, that is not just a cost center, but now is actually bringing in revenue because one, you can now, you, you've got a lot of commercial, you can, a lot of this water that they're moving ain't theirs. So there's some commerciality fact to this. It's a big part mm -hmm. of this. And I think it's a reason why the, as you mentioned, the price point was 5 billion versus maybe that three and a half to four and a half. Um, right. Devin also came out and said, as we see in this last bullet point here, um, they're going to expand their buyback authorization by over 66% to about $5 billion. So uh, that's good for all of your um, Devon shareholders out there. I think the other thing to uh, where was it here? Um, I, you know, if we look here on slide nine, I think here's the just going back quickly to those financial metrics. Again, they're assuming eighty dollar oil, which. I'll quabble about a little bit. That seems to be a little <laughs> bit too aggressive to me, but hey, you're an IR. You got to do what you got to do. Um, you know, I love this one. Less than four than four times EBITDA or EBITDAX in this case, because we, we we don't really want to know what the capital, um, you, you, we're not including capital in this. So what does that mean? That really means it's 3.99998 maybe. So we can, <laughs> for math assumptions, we're going to assume about four just to make it easy. Um, they're going to see cash flow growth of about 10% per share, not terrible free cash flow generation. They'll see about 15% to their, their top line. And of course, we get that word accretive again um, in terms of getting their share buybacks and dividend payout. So you can see on the right-hand side, there, seventy dollar oil. It's about a nine percent cash um, flow increase. Eighty is twelve percent, and uh, a ninety is uh, is about fourteen percent. So you can see that slight incremental degradation there. But I mean, that's kind of the high level stuff. There's a there's a bunch of stuff yeah. I want to dive into. One, I want to dive into the midstream stuff a little bit. I want to dive into three mile laterals. But let's just take a step back. You've done a really really good job, and it's one reason I love Well Database here. Of kind of let's just go back to the beginning of of Grayson Mill and talk about those two acquisitions and then kind of what Grayson Mill did after those acquisitions to put themselves in the position they are uh, to grow. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, one to, to, to finish up on those, uh, the one thing that I noticed after our last evaluation, we did that, um, that the market wasn't super thrilled with these, this level of acquisition. They really liked the, the Hess deal. They liked the Diamondback deal. They did not care for, the the five billion dollar deal and it's really peculiar to see um but we you know the minute i heard this i jump and look at their stock price over the three days post this announcement uh you know they it, maybe it was just only like eight percent that they dropped uh they've recovered all of that now by the way but it lends to what you were just saying with all of the bullet points so much is like we're doing this deal and then let's dive in and, and make sure our shareholders are excited about it uh because the market just wasn't loving these deals that being mm -hmm. said you know it's a solid deal. It's a solid deal on both parts. I think there's, there's, um, I think that the, the values there, I think it's just pretty equal, pretty solid, um, uh, just acquisition to start with, but to jump back and talk about where, uh, kind of where these came from, you know, you've already touched on this with how, uh, Grayson Mill acquired those assets from Equinor and then Oventive after that. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm not mistaken. Those midstream assets were a part of Equinor's acquisition as well. Yes. I could be wrong on that. Um, the interesting thing about these assets is that when most of these were acquired, so again, um, I believe it was Equinor, was it Equinor that took on Brigham? Um, yes. Way it back was when. kind of a merger of, not a merger of equals because Equinor is a huge company, but kind of a, a merger of Brigham and at that time, Stat Oil to kind of create this standalone Bakken entity right. that was kind of operating in isolation up there. Exactly. And so... Um, the most interesting part about that and then uh, the Oventive is that those assets were mostly acquired 
Uh, and if you look at the deals that those, uh, the, the acquisitions from those periods of time, those are actually valued significantly higher, in my opinion, than what they were when Grayson Mill acquired them. So uh, Grayson Mill really looked to acquire some assets that were still financially solid for the most part, but they were devalued at the time of the acquisition. So I mean, again, just, just to jump in, that's the understatement of the century to talk about <laughs> how they were overvalued. Holy smokes. Yeah. And so it's great. I mean, at the end of the day, timing is everything. Uh, and it just holds true here. But if we look at the kind of the breakdown, uh, and so in Well Database, what I did because of the fact that these are all operated under Grayson Mill today, we need to go back to the original operators. And one thing that you can do in Well Database that's awesome is that you can search by the original versus yeah. the current operator. You can also pull together the various operators that come up. So when we talk about the Equinor wells, if I come and look at this layer that I've created, those are actually brought up from Brigham, EOG, uh, which was just a few out outliers, uh, Equinor, and some Whiting wells. Um, those are the four as the original operators that were involved. Um, in that original acquisition. And so that's a cool thing in Well Database. I was able to pull those together, drop those in into the Equinor layer, did the same thing for Oventive. Um, but what we can see is as far as assets go, um, they were basically black and white. They they were just buying production plus some spots. They were they went from being extremely overvalued to maybe a little bit undervalued, which led, you know, explains why Grayson Mill jumped from a Powder River Basin to a Bakken player, you know, seemingly overnight. Um, that being added in, I will drop in that the Powder River Basin, Wyoming federal lands have had just a nightmare in the permit world. I believe last I looked, there's something like 18,000 canceled permits in the Powder River Basin due to federal delays. So mm -hmm. that plays into this as well when we're looking at the bigger picture. Uh, but again, we're talking about solid assets, nothing that will blow the doors down, but it was just good core assets in the Bakken. We can see that, um, you know, we have the red are the Econor assets and then the um, the darker, darker olive are the, uh, they're outlined in the uh, event of assets. Um, and then the Grayson Mill stuff that they drilled, you can kind of highlight there as well. Uh, but if we're looking at those and we're doing something like type curves, uh, we can see that, you know, Grayson Mill has improved upon the type curve over time. So that is, can't be understated. They bought solid assets but Grayson Mill has taken those assets and have improved upon them yep. to an extent. They haven't necessarily turned into the number one player in the basin across the board, but they have made solid strides for improved performance. Um, and this way, this type curve is going to be weighted down from some of the older assets and things like that. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, but Grayson Mill did acquire those assets. They were solid, kind of well-performing assets. One thing you touched on was the gas oil ratio. In the Bakken, you see over time, that trends um, in, a, in an interesting way. So if I come over and look at the monthly production, and I'm going to flip off uh, the um, Grayson Mill as the original operator here. Uh, so we can just look at all. So this is going to turn on all Grayson Mill wells again. So you can see I have them highlighted, but now they're all on here. Um, one of the interesting mixes you see, obviously, well count is, is rolling up but our gas numbers are increasing at a faster ratio. Yeah. If I look at a type well uh, in this, you can also spot kind of how the gas uh, oil ratio, the gas continues to kind of uh, take a flatter decline than the oil does. Um, the other thing you'll notice that whenever you're looking into uh, by well type, you have some lighter oil. That's what the lighter green dots are. And if I come into my production dashboard, I can come over by, um, by well type. Um, and this will kind of break down those lighter oil. So we have the heavier black oil uh, wells, but then that volatile oil, which is a higher mm -hmm. GOR. Um, if we flip over to the type curve on those, there is a dynamic there where the uh, lift for those allows for the, see the volatile oil will have a higher initial production mm -hmm. and a flatter decline than your black oil does. Mm -hmm. So there are more than one dynamic at play when it comes to the gas oil ratios in the Bakken. And yes, over time, they will always increase. Um, but there's a lifting mechanism that helps promote a longer term flatter decline in, Bakken, in the Bakken wells as well. So all that being said, being able to handle the gas is your number one concern. And we just talked about the midstream, which is, I mean, I believe in North Dakota's dictated, I believe it's only 4% of your, um, either 4 or 8% of your total gas production can be vented or flared now. And so yeah. it's not only it's 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 not just a cost issue to deal with anymore. It's a regulatory issue as well. 
So again, all of this adds up to those midstream assets had to be just pivotal in the decision that these and in the cost structure and in the decision for Devin to come in here. Yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I think, you know, the, the one thing that I kind of, you know, you, I, I love this view that we're looking at right here, which is kind of the, the, the Grayson mill. I think the interesting part is where the Devin wells are relative to where Grayson mill is. And mm-hmm. it's, there's, there's a little bit of a difference. It's not quite as contiguous maybe as you would have hoped. Again, that may not be the, the point of what Devin was hoping for or looking yeah. at really in this acquisition, but there's not as much, you know, the, the synergies that you're going to see from this are probably not as heavy as you would have expected because that midstream infrastructure that's running through all of those wells that you've got popped up here don't run through the current assets that Devin has. So that's one thing you don't see sprinkled throughout this presentation, which everybody on M&A touts synergies. Well, we're not, that's (laughs) not what they're actually touting on this, this, you know, uh, in this deal per se, or at least what they're publicly talking about, which again, I just find interesting from a, from that standpoint. Yeah. It's not a question at, at all. If you look at where uh, on this map here, I still have the Grayson mill uh, and the kind of the acquisitions over here on the, on the Western North and Western side, you can see that there is next to, or, or really literally zero overlap. Honestly, you are, uh, you know, a, a full section, a full township away from where any of those assets, which are the, the assets, that's there. It was still operated as I could roll this up as parent company to show you the Devon, but still to kind of get a look, there is literally no synergy or anything here. But like you said, there doesn't need to be. It, there's no reason for it. That they Grayson Mill did a great job of positioning himself as a self-contained asset, which meant that your buyer is anyone. You don't have to be a Bakken player to do this. You don't have to, you know, be a, a okay. pure play, anything. Anyone could just walk in turnkey, have assets with infrastructure in place and a drill plan ready to roll, which I think is why, again, on top of the financials, why it was able to command the price they did when others were saying that it wasn't worth it. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, so, I mean, the other big, so you, you talk about the big stuff that's being touted in this one, it's the amount of running room in terms of the overall acreage footprint. I mean, you talk about Devin's current acreage footprint, uh, footprint that you see down there is only about 120,000 acres. Grayson Mills is about a little over 300,000. So you're about tripling, you know, a little less than tripling your, um, your acreage, which is, which gives you the running room. So they've got about 5,000 net locations. I thought the interesting thing that they pointed out, if you go and read through the transcript, I went ahead and, 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 uh, read that a few times, actually then listened to it to see if I could catch, you know, sometimes you, sometimes the way something's transcribed versus kind of the tone of the question Mm -hmm. or the way the answer can be a little bit different, but they're touting over 60% of those locations are the infamous three mile lateral. And I know if you've listened to the deal spotlight at all, we sound like a broken record, but that's really where the majority of the upside to a lot of these deals are being touted as is, Hey, we're now moving from a stock two mile lateral to a three mile lateral. And I think there's some really interesting data that we were looking at prior to this that show why companies are doing the three mile lateral. So let's, let's, let's move to that a little bit. And what we've got pulled up here is kind of the overall, um, a Bakken view of the three mile lateral. And then we'll kind of dive into the individual companies here, but I think this is a super yeah. interesting look. Yeah, absolutely. No, the, the, what we've seen and, you know, honestly, we, we kind of touched on this before the, we, the pin is carry such a consistency, um, yes. which it always have. I, and, and mm-hmm. I heard from this, um, Gosh, it is 15 years ago here in drillers talking about you can't you can't lose, which is a bad attitude to have. That's where three quarters of the refrac <laughs> opportunities are coming from because of the sloppy, sloppy drilling. But at the same time, um, you know, you can't lose. It's very consistent. And yep. so what we're seeing is the strategies around the the wells, the drilling, the completions are just scaling almost linearly with the, so they didn't have to re-engineer, re- reinvent this wheel. Yep. They took the strategies on a two mile lateral, just extended out another mile. And lo and behold, you're at the same profit loading. You're at the same, uh, same everything, same kind of cluster build. And, and then you, you see this production uptick that is kind of linear on a per foot basis. And then, so at the end of the day, what you end up with is what are your cost savings by 
having a rig on site, having all of the completion, having a one job to do a three mile lateral rather than to do, you know, two jobs. And, and that's really what you're talking about. I believe I've read anywhere from 25 to 35, uh, up to 40 percent cost savings by being efficient with a single drill site and pad preparation completions, the whole nine yards. And so by it scaling linearly like that, it's fantastic. Uh, it just, you can't lose. Um, Absolutely. Um, you can kind of see here, you've got the big boys, obviously continentals, the, the hundred pound gorilla in the room, but mm -hmm. let's go. I want to look at these type wells here. Here's some. Yeah, big absolutely. Wells. Yeah. And so we'll normalize these by lateral length too, just to kind of give us, cause when we did this search, um, it, it is, we kind of just did 12,000 feet or yeah. longer. Um, just kind of give us a broader, and we did limit it to 2017 and newer. Uh, there were some some wells were toyed with 317 uh, with three million three mile laterals, but what we see with the profit loading and everything kind of hit its stride in 17 in the Bakken. Um, and there are some interesting outliers for sure. Um, you know, we have some interesting peaks here. When we flip this over to a QM chart, you, you do have to kind of take into account the operator strategies that they employ, um, whether or not they're choking back, whether or not they are, um, how they're dealing with pressure. I think even Grayson Mill um, had that in some of their three mile laterals that they've run. They, um, in, in that presentation on the deal, uh, they showed four, four of their wells, one of them, which was significantly under the other uh, three. And it was because it was running on a pump that had a limit that was like 2000. Don't, I forget what it was, 20, 2000 versus 2500, some manner. Um, but their estimations is that they would see a similar EUR from it over time because they're essentially controlling pressure that way. Um, but you see that play out here. Marathon's type curve shoots up, and then we start to see it level off when Oasis, and again, Oasis Cord will show up as a current operator now as Oasis. I, I didn't want to roll these up by the um, by the parent operator. I wanted to look at each one individually. Uh, so, but this Oasis, these Oasis options, as well as the Petro Hunt here, uh, they all kind of cross over over time with what looks to be a little bit more of a controlled uh, pumping situation or a choke situation, depending on what what we're looking at. But at the end of the day, your your variance between these, you know, at the sixty month mark, some of the the worst wells, um, they they're oh, this is normalized, so that number doesn't make any sense. But our our range, you know, they they're pretty tight. Um, but there is some some uh, some interesting things in here. And so Grayson Mill Mill right here, it's kind of hard to see, but it is at the upper middle of the pack. It's right yep. here. Um, and so obviously they've done a pretty fair job with it. I really want to see, um, the other, well, the, the, cause they have only done a handful. How many was that? Eight. eight. They've done eight of them. Um, I want to see that other well that they talked about choking back on that pump for that pressure. Cause I have a feeling that you'll see a higher EUR from it over time. Um, yeah. but again, what we're seeing is pretty tight, some consistency. If we come over and look at, I think we had this custom chart up here about the prop per lateral length. Um, we're not seeing any kind of new strategies around this, not any new costs or anything like that. We're using the same strategies, just drilling longer, producing more. Uh, and the uptick is, is, uh, the efficiency savings on the drill DNC and then the uh, production uptick. It's just math that works out really well. Yeah, no, I mean, it's that chart that you just showed right there, I think is super interesting. It's, 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 we're not breaking any news to anybody who's who's listening here, they're like, well, duh, that's why people, why people <laughs> went from one to two mile laterals because of the cost savings. But it's, it, it's really nice just to see it formulated and like, Oh, well, that's why. And so I, I think it's super interesting. Um, you know, and you can see there's the Bakken has drilled a lot of three mile ladders. I mean, I wouldn't have told you 322 was the actual was the actual number. Mm -hmm. I just said it maybe it was in the hundred mark. But that, you know, I, I think you're going to see that double and triple within the next you know, 24 months. Absolutely. And that, that is key. We've seen it in these last two acquisitions. It's, it is the key of the future of it. And that's all about what your, your leasehold looks like. Do you, do you have leases that support the three mile lateral? That's, that's key. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you can see that, um, you, you know, again, I just love, I love the ability about how you guys on this, that you, and you guys on well database have laid this out. It, it's super awesome. Um, I, I think Thank the you. other, you know, I think the other interesting part, we'll go ahead and here. I want to throw up slide. Where is it here? Uh, there's slide eight. And I just want to talk a little bit specifically about that midstream, that midstream infrastructure. They go ahead and say that that midstream business does about 125 million of, uh, of EBIT acts per year, which is pretty, again, turning a 
what generally is a cost center into a revenue generator. And I think you brought up something that it's it's with the new flaring regulations in North Dakota. The reason why you have midstream infrastructure is not so that you can get paid on your gas. No one really cares about how much you're getting paid on gas. On gas, it's so that you can get your oil wells. You can get these. You don't have to choke your wells back. You can turn right. them on full blast and actually have an ability to take that gas away and whatever wherever it goes, it 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 allows you to get your oil to market. They have really good connections both to the Dakota Access Pipeline, the North Dakota Pipeline, planes, and multiple other opera and a takeaway and, and midstream operators in that area. So, you mm-hmm. know, if if you look here specifically on that map that we're showing here, I mean it's there it's their acreage foot is is pretty riddled up on that northwest spot. You kind of see that's what's funny is as you get closer and closer to um Devon stuff, the midstream infrastructure sort of goes away. And maybe that's exactly where and and my guess is that's where a lot of the locations are probably the new development is going to be because they have the ability now to drill out that stuff. So, you know, having that midstream, I mean, I I can I can tell you from experience, there's, you know, everyone argues over models. It doesn't matter whether it's 5,000 bucks a month off of a fixed cost and a dollar 50 per oil or 10,000 per month. And, you know, 250, but it does not matter. There's two things that matters. What's your EUR and what's your water disposal costs and having this type of infrastructure and water disposal specifically and the gas mm-hmm. takeaway, because it allows you to actually keep your wells on is critical and i think i think you hit the nail on the head that's why the the price was commanded as high because it's not just about well what's the what's the future forecasted value you have to layer in all this other stuff and the ability to say you're not going to be held up by future development even if they go to zero flaring we've got the ability to handle it all so i I think it's important not to skip over this midstream stuff Absolutely. Well, and you and you hit uh, you touched on the water disposal, uh, which is something they do. They discuss as well. Uh, you know, what's interesting is the I mean, the water disposal assets they have are actually pretty limited. Uh, but I suppose they're enough. That's one thing that I found interesting. They don't. It's not like they've got a, a massive water disposal system in place. But again, they do have a, a few water disposal wells out there, um, and so that the definitely is going to facilitate that water disposal side of things. You know, again, you hit it on the midstream side. You you need all of these pieces to line up. And again, that just kind of shows that it was a turnkey, you know, ready to roll yep. uh, production model. So, yep. Nope. I completely agree. Um, I, I want to shift a little bit now and talk. I want to talk about Devin's angle here, because one of the things I like to do when I look at these deals is, okay, great. Devin made this deal. We, we like Grayson Mill. If I had $5 billion, maybe I would have jumped in and, and we could have bought <laughs> this. But I like to go back and say, okay, where was Devin's mind at? Prior to this, and one of the easiest things to do is go look at their earnings presentation. This is May 1st, 2024. Okay, so this is 60 ish days prior to them acquiring um, uh, Grayson Mill. And so you don't know where they were in the in the life cycle of this deal. Were they already talking to great to end cap? Were they not? Were they thinking about what to do? Obviously they were kind of the last man standing when it comes to, hey, what are we going to do from an M- MA standpoint? Every one of our uh large public compadres have actually gone ahead and done and done some deals. So it really, you know, you 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 think you obviously know that they were tossing around a bunch of different deals. But if you just go back to their Q1 2024 earnings report, I mean, what I find interesting is that they had very little to say about their their Bakken asset. And actually, if you go, you know, you, you start looking at all of their individual slides. I mean, you get to slide 13 on their presentation. We'll throw it up here again. This is from their Q1 2024 earnings report there. Look at point number two here. High grade activity in the Williston Basin, activity focused on high confidence developments, and we're going to reduce capital activity by 50% relative to their 2023 program, which I find super interesting that they're going to tell you on May 1st, hey, we're going to actually reduce our capital in the Bakken by 50%. And then 60 days later, they triple their production in Basin and now say, hey, we're going to go run some rigs through it. So, and, and maybe the, the, hey, we're reducing our capital act. Maybe the thought is, hey, we're reducing our capital activity in the Williston, but we're just going to go beef it up and buy a bunch of production. Maybe that was the plan. But I, I find it interesting that they kind of, they didn't, 
in my opinion, they weren't necessarily thinking about it then because they would have said something and they wouldn't have right. necessarily. I don't think that second bullet point in there, reducing capital activity by 50 percent versus 2023. They probably would have left that out if they were you know, on the cusp of making this deal. And, and it brings me to kind of my 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 from Devin's side. I, I just think they got caught with their pants down in terms of they needed to make a deal. They were probably getting pressure from the board to do something in terms of, you know, everybody had, you know, they were the last man standing when it comes to all of these M and a deals. They were probably sniffing around on crown rock. They were probably sniffing around on marathon. And when they couldn't come to those deals, well, this was a deal that they could make. It fit within their parameters. I mean, you brought this up when we were talking earlier, this was 3.25 billion in cash, you know, one of the things that I first thought of was, well, why didn't Cord go out and now just swoop up Grayson Mill? This would have been a much more synergistic and to use the to use our favorite word, accretive acquisition from Cord side. Now that they're really one of the top players within the Williston Basin, but you brought up specifically, well, it comes back to the cash. NCAP's not going to go for an all stock deal, which is what Cord had to do to get Enter Plus. So right. I think Devin saw this as a chance to let's go get some assets. We, let's go get buy some production. We get a bunch of midstream assets. Maybe we're paying a little bit more relative to what we think. But I, I still, from a Devin side, I'm not, I have a little, this always just comes back to my thought of like, people always joke that these management teams are just shooting from the hip a little bit. And this doesn't bring me much more confidence that Devin is like, oh, well, we've got a master plan here relative to, you know, and obviously when new information comes in, they get presented with the opportunity to buy this. Maybe they come in, but everybody knew this was available. There was a, you know, if you get leaked to Reuters yeah. in January, <laughs> everybody knows it. So right. you, you knew about this at NAEP. I mean, and obviously it would, it was, it was leaked at NAEP. It was leaked before this, but it, it wasn't a, a shocker that, oh, private equity buys low in 2021 and now is trying to sell it higher. Like, it's not a shocker. Everybody knows that's right. what happens. So from Devin's side, I, I, you know, it doesn't, you know, if, 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 if there was something to be said about, wow, this management team knows exactly what they're doing. They obviously do. They're, they're, they've made some great acquisitions in the Delaware. They're one of the companies that was ahead of the curve on the Delaware, which if we start going and ranking shale plays, the Delaware Basin currently is going to be at the hippie top and edge of the spear. So they've done a good job there. But to me, this just seems like they got caught with their pants down and needed to do something. And this was something that they were able to probably come to an agreement relatively quickly relative to May 1st. They weren't even talking about this. So that's really all I'll yeah. say from Devin's side. Well, and I'll double down on that because I, I equate it to, um, you know, showing up at conferences, you know, well, database, we show up at conferences and we have it in our minds. Like if you don't show up the next year, people are going to think that you just, you died or something yep. like that. And that was a mentality. I remember at Nate for, for a better part of a decade, it was like, you had to come back. And if your booth got smaller, then you must not be doing good. Or if you don't show up, then there's a problem. That's what I feel like we're in now with the acquisition world. If you are a mid-major or higher and you haven't made an acquisition in the last 18 months, then are you, are you, are you going away? What, what's, what's the yep. problem? Um, and so in that, that does transition. Uh, you know, you brought up a uh, cord and I'd love to, to talk about that for a second yes. because that was, I mean, I don't think it was just us who thought, well, that was a blatant, like an obvious uh, fit um, that they would go through and pick up Grayson Mill. Uh, and so when they didn't come in, it was it, uh, your immediate reaction is like, oh, wow, what's going on with them? Are they for sale? You know, is that what we're looking at? Which I'm not, I'm not saying they are or aren't, but they might be. They could be. Who knows? Um, but, you know, looking at this, we pulled this map up and saw kind of that inner plus, those inner plus wells compared. So what we have is cord is the primary wells and the Grayson Mill are the, uh, so the blue is all cord yep. and, and then the Grayson Mill is those to the, the west and north that are just completely intertwined with cord's acreage. It's Absolutely. like the most natural fit on the planet. And there had to be like, I mean, those midstream assets would pay, you know, double for these, for, for, um, for cord in this regard, because they are all completely, you know, geolocated to each other. But I think you hit the nail on the head. It has to be the cash thing. Private equity does not want your stock right now because they opened a fund. They need to close it out. They need cash to to kind of get back to where they need to be. And so that's why you get the inner plus acquisition, which comparatively looks ridiculous from a you know synergy standpoint. It, of course, it sits um, you know, offset of the the cord stuff. And so it's not like it's ridiculous, but at the same time, when you compare it to Grayson Mill, it looks like Grayson Mill would have just been head and shoulders above a better fit. Um, but again, 
it's cash. Cash is king in this deal. No, absolutely. And, you know, not being necessarily able to leverage the infrastructure that's sitting on the current Grayson Mill acreage versus what's now sitting on the, you know, kind of the legacy Devon assets. It's super interesting. Um, I, I mean, so from Cord's standpoint, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that was a 90-10 stock cash consideration, which mm-hmm. as a public company, you can leverage your stock a lot more. And as you're acquiring another public company, it makes it a little easier to do stock. I think again, the cash part of this is is the biggest. You know, the other thing, you know, from NCAP side, I mean, it is a pretty good, a pretty good classic private equity flip. I mean, you spend about 2.5 or 1.7 billion dollars. Um in original acquisitions, they drilled about 75, 78 wells, probably spent somewhere in the range of 75 to $90 million on those wells, was able to basically boost production by 45, somewhere between 30 to 45,000 BOE a day. So you're talking about a total of 2.5 billion in cash. And that's a pretty good deal, considering you're talking about it's a year and a half return relative to when this all got put together. Uh, they walk mm-hmm. away, obviously, with being able to return some cash to the shareholders or, or their fund institutional uh, shareholders, I should say. And, you yeah. know, that stock, who knows, you know, that most of that stock probably sits within the end cap portfolio and they're able to leverage that uh, for a variety right. of reasons. So, I mean, all in all, if from, from Grayson Mills side and end cap side, you played it perfectly. I just always come back to, you know, I think they got, they, they had Devin in a corner and were able to extract everything that they wanted and, and maybe yeah. a little bit more. Right. And that's uh, there's something to be said for holding your ground on that. You know, that number did, like I said, everyone thought it was high. Um, and so for them to get it from a company that is considered relatively conservative in their approach um, is pretty solid. Uh, one thing I will note uh, as we kind of look at this, this is the total production for all wells in Grayson Mills, uh, that everything that just changed hands or is changing hands. And you see the black line is a number of wells that have come online. So they've got about 1,260 producing wells right now. Um, and so I go back, predate, uh, you know, the Grayson Mills stuff happened in what 2020 19 something like that or 21 um but regardless you you know you see these kind of flat production and uh, obviously we've come up some on the on the oil number but again you have to watch those declining wells um you know drilling 70 80 wells that is almost 1300 wells those gas numbers are are this is the across the bakken those gas numbers just keep increasing while your yep. oil stays relatively flat um and so all those new new wells coming online obviously they did build, build their production up uh an amount but so much of what they had to bring online was to offset the decline from the old wells and with that decline comes an increased gas production and so there are some interesting dynamics that are really specific to the bakken in this regard that we see today i'm sure we'll see some more of this as we get some more age the bakken's great because we got a lot of data on the yep on the shale side. And so it's fun to kind of watch these and see how they progress. But uh, I think, again, you said it, Grayson Mill played it perfectly um, and in- stuck to its guns on that 5 billion number and everybody wins. We're in good shape. The shale business is tough. You know, people are like, yeah. well, I'm spending $50 million to keep my oil production flat. Yeah. Welcome to the, de- welcome to the nature of declining assets, guys. Yep. That's it. Well, so, okay. But I, all in all, it's a it's a pretty good deal. I mean, it, I wish you, you know, I wish we'd have more sexy deals. But hey, this is fun anyway. It's a solid deal. It's got some interesting dynamics to it. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it's it'd be interesting to try to to say what the next one looks like. Which brings me to a picture of the Bakken as a whole. There's a consolidation has really really taken effect in here, and um, it'll be interesting to see where Cord comes into play now. Are they potentially going to be a seller? Um, don't know. That's a great question. I, I think the real, in in my opinion, since since you did a great job of forecasting the next deal, I'm going to go out on a limb <laughs> now and say what I think. I, I mean, it's going to take a little bit because obviously we've the, the, we have to. Everything's got to shake out with uh, with the with what's going to happen, in Guyana. But I think Hess and Exxon, once that gets shaked out, I think Exxon, if they go ahead and do either acquire Hess or Chevron acquire whoever I think acquires Hess in this situation is going to shed Hess's Bach and stuff. And it'll be interesting to see who picks that up. That's valid. Completely valid. I, I'd love to see that one. Um, and yeah, we could even come through and I mean, we can look at their assets right now. Hess's assets are pretty core um, to the Bakken. I think they fit with a lot of the operators. So it's a, that one becomes a pretty open game about what they're asking for, what they're required to get. But yes, you're exactly right. Those are the kind of assets that 
definitely will 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 be um, on the on the chopping block if regulatory hurdles um, show themselves in in regard to that. Well, because I mean, Exxon's come out and said, "Hey, man, we have no interest in the Bakken if we end up." winning this first right of refusal game that they're playing down with because the, they're only after acquiring that uh, extra interest yep. in the Guyana stuff. If Chevron mm-hmm. gets it, I mean, Chevron is not in the Bakken right now, so they maybe have the skill and the want to, hey, we have no problem entering um, the Bakken, but I I just have a feeling that, you know, if ExxonMobil wins, which I don't know where, you know, if I had to gamble, I, I think what's going to happen is Exxon's going to win this and going to end up buying out uh, Hess's position in Guyana. I think then Hess, instead of sitting around here and and just well, now we're just only in the box. I think again they're going to want to sell out specifically. So it'll be interesting to see yeah. who pops in. Maybe that's what Court is waiting for. They're waiting for Hess maybe everything so. to shake out with Hess and and they go ahead and, and and make that move or maybe Continental. Who knows? I mean they're you know they they're also they're the hundred pound gorilla in the room that I'm surprised didn't jump in on any of these deals and maybe they're waiting to make that yeah. acquisition of Hess's Bach and stuff. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I don't have it up in front of me, but I do believe I saw the last earnings report. Hess is great about breaking out their North American assets versus yep. their international assets. And if I'm not mistaken, that Bakken asset is barely, barely breaking even. It's just not a very attractive asset uh, for them today. And I think that that will make it a um, a deal that someone's going to get a, a deal on it. So if that happens, if that rolls out, so that'll be interesting to watch. Yeah, so you heard it here first, guys. Um, whenever it happens, we'll make sure to uh, play that way back machine in a bit. Well, there anything else that you think we're missing here? Otherwise, I think we'll we'll let people get out of here. I uh, I always appreciate you popping on, and I just love being able to. It's so easy just to flip through Well Database and see all this stuff. I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing, and and I always appreciate your time and coming on and uh, and 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 explaining some stuff to us. Yeah, no, thank you so much. I, I love doing. It. I love diving into details. I spend so much time, uh, you know, helping customers and working, and I, I don't get so much time to use the software we create. So I absolutely love it when it when it can answer these questions and give us these views and and kind of the insights we want to see so quickly. Uh, so no, I, I love it, and you know, the Bakken. I I feel like I'm in a crazy minority because I actually really like the Bakken. I like the I like the consistency of it. I like the uh, the the mat that how everything kind of lays out. The I know there are a lot of hurdles there, but again, I enjoy the activity in the Bakken. So no, it's been great. I and I'm looking forward to the Hess deal that you called. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. So, all right, guys. Well, as always, we'll give Devin the stamp of approval on this, even though I think they got to, you know, they're probably uh, just wait. They probably needed a deal to do, but we, you know, we're big fans of Grayson Mill over here. So we'll go ahead and and give this one the the stamp of approval, guys. John, as always, I appreciate it. Thanks for everybody who's joining us. Go ahead and hit the description below. We'll have links so you can get to Well Database. You can obviously, it's easy to just find them online um, and all the links to some of the backup stuff, guys. Um, Until the next deal, we'll see you then. Thanks, Mike.